Uh, what's this? 2003 Porsche Boxster. I don't like it. It's not Japanese. Why does my hat feel wrong? Why does it suddenly look graceful and urbane? I feel weird. I'm becoming... My vision is changing! I can see! I see beyond the veil! Hello, darling! I will now enter you! This is the way. 2003 Porsche Boxster. This episode of Regular Car Reviews is sponsored by AG1. AG1 is daily nutrition made powerfully simple. I'm on the road a lot. I'm filming cars. I'm going out to meet you. Sometimes I'm not eating the best food. That little hotel commissary. Meh. Some chain restaurant next to the hotel where I get my plate of hot brown and glass of cold yellow. No, I need supplements. Slamming donuts and chugging coffee before a film shoot, yeah, you'll feel fine for like 15 minutes, but afterwards, you crash. With AG1, I feel energized all day. And with the little travel packs, and with the vitamin D3 and K2 supplement, I'm ready to run around cars in the hot sun. And that's good because of all the running around, this also supports cardiovascular health, cellular health, and helps keep up my metabolism. You think we're stopping regular car reviews? I want to keep doing this for the rest of my life. And I'm a gym rat too. AG1 helps me replenish my daily micronutrients, especially on workout days, which is almost every day. No days off, bro. It also has a ton of magnesium, which helps you if you're doing drop sets like I always do. AG1 has 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients. It's gluten-free, dairy-free, paleo, and vegan, keto. And there's less than one gram of naturally occurring sugar per serving, which is amazing because this stuff tastes good. Dude, I seriously recommend this. Click on the link in the description. Go to drinkag1.com slash RCR for a free one year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five travel packs free with your first purchase. Once again, click on the link in the description. Go to drinkag1.com slash RCR for a free one year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five travel packs free with your first purchase. Thank you. And thank you for supporting regular car reviews. I am stuck. No, I'm not. I'm a Porsche guy now. Yep. Let's uh, let's see this engine. It's a flat six. It's not in the trunk. The trunk is in the trunk. Move the roof a little more. Yeah. The, the engine is mid, or rather mid-whatever. It's a 2.7 liter M96.23, right? Makes uh, 222, 225, 220 horsepower. Porsche people like to... You find it yet? No? All right. This 2003 Boxster, or 986, if you want to sound cool, gets to 60 miles an hour if you can work the long throw manual transmission fast enough, six and a half seconds, six and a half seconds to uh, 60. Did you find out how to expose the engine yet? No? All right. The cylinder heads are almost in line with the lower chassis. Uh-oh, looking at your phone, you don't know. Okay, call your friend Chris and ask him so you can't get to it. So we can't look at it. Okay, fine. It, it's down there somewhere, but it's 2003. And you paid way too much for a Boxster. Because here's the build sheet for this one. So, okay. Base price back in 2003 was $42,600. Adjusted for inflation to 2023, that is $70,774. But it gets better because we got options. Now, all these options are in 2003 dollars. Here we go. Arctic Silver Metallic Paint, $825. Nephrite Green Leather Interior, rad, totally rad, $2,010. Power Seats, 
$1,550. Bose sound system, nice. $1,860. Heated seats, $410. 17-inch wheels, $1,235. And a bunch of other miscellaneous stuff. So let's get to the executive options. Do you want your floor mats to match your green interior? That is $95. Do you want aluminum dials? $675. How about the a leather and wood steering wheel? Now here's the original. He has a second one here. If you wanted this option, it is $1,535. Would you like the Porsche crest in your headrests? Well, that is $220. Oh, and of course you want the wooden shift knob to match your wooden steering wheel, right? $795. Total price in 2003? $56,135. Adjusted for inflation, 20 years, that is $93,260 for a Boxster. Now, I was about to continue this flabbergasted VO here, but the current 718 Boxster S MSRPs for $105,000. So, all right, what are you doing now? You're trying to fit in the trunk. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense as anything else we've been talking about this morning. You're tall. Are you sure you can? Oh, you're making it happen. Oh, okay. Well, while you're doing that, I'm going to read the manual. Dear owner, we would like to thank you for your purchase of a Porsche sports car. Mm. Judging by the car you have chosen, you are a motorist of a special brain. And you are probably no novice when it comes to automobile. Remember, however, as with any vehicle, you should take time to familiarize yourself with your Porsche and its performance car. <laughs> Always drive within your unique capabilities as a driver and your level of expertise with your Porsche. Ensure that anyone else driving your Porsche does the same. To prevent or minimize injury, always use your safety bill. Never consume alcohol or drugs before or during the operation of your vehicle. Dear Porsche owner, a law has gone into the manufacturer of your Porsche, including advanced engineering, rigid quality control, and demanding inspections. These engineering and safety features will be enhanced by you. Ah. Uh. You got doinked down there, didn't you? Good, that won't make me feel bad, Kevin, when I peel out in your car. I don't know what it's gonna do. I was not intending to do that. I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> no, you're good. And then the back got happy in a turn. Ooh. There you go. <laughs> nice. I was not expecting it to do that. Mm -hmm. Was that for me lifting? It could have been, yeah. Could have been lift off. I'm like, that is, that is sliding. I'm not expecting it, but it's doing it slowly. I hope I didn't scare you. Though. No, you're good. Oh yeah. It's very, I, I thought it was gonna keep going, and I and I go like a circle in the in the road. Yeah. No, it's actually really controllable if you if you get oversteer. Yeah. Look at my face here. I'm thinking. Oh crap, the Porsche is going sideways, the Porsche is going sideways, mid-rear engine, car is going sideways. This feels different than a front engine V8 where you just where you just lift off and let it ride out. This is weird, this is weird. Oh dear God, Lord of Counter Steer, please guide my hands. And that 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 was entirely in this like half a second, that's what I was thinking. Elegance. Ease of movement. A Porsche 
Boxster, joie de vivre. When you're done screwing around with this, this is this is a real luxury car. It's small, and all its power is mid-range with just a garnish of high, that up-high buzz, that's lemon zest on your G&T that you didn't ask for, but you're happy to taste. And the Boxster is fun to cruise in, too. Take it at the speed limit, and I feel like I'm riding out the dot-com crash on amber waves of undeveloped land I just bought. 2003 Porsche Boxster. It's good to own land. The manual shifter, though. This is mutual fun long. And because it's only a five-speed where fifth is a highway gear, you only have four to really play with, and you're going to lose a lot of revs in between shifts. It's not the easiest car to match rev on the way going down, either. But, oh, this trapper keeper green leather. You make me feel like I got all my long division done on the bus ride home, which means I can watch tailspin when I get home. And it's fun to hear the engine behind and below you not just behind you and in your ear like an MR2. There is body roll and that weird liftoff oversteer, but as I unexpectedly experienced, it is controllable and happens at very low speeds. That S2000 we gave away would ravage this Boxster in every instance. The S2000 is a better roadster and holds its value like Apple stock. More aftermarket support, Easier, way easier to work on. The only thing a Boxster does better than an S2000 is hold more stuff because it has a trunk and a frunk. But man, that IMS bearing, that was flawed by Porsche and it, it's like there, it's the sword of Damocles of this car. The IMS bearing gets hot, under lubed, and then when it gets hot, it gets weak. And in the worst case, and in the worst scenario, um, the chain's gonna jump timing, and suddenly your valves and pistons experiment with rough trade. So the second you see a little dribble of oil coming out to where that intermediate shaft is, you get your Boxster or Cayman for that matter to the shop. There are two types of Porsche owners. The friendly ones who don't let it touch them at a core level, the kind that are happy to talk with you about the thing they bought, the thing they love. Uh, the more adventurous might even let you drive it. And then there's the rest. Oh look. A Porsche Boxster. For the longest time, when I saw Porsche Boxsters, you know, even back in 2023, I mean, my, my mom loved these a lot. I looked at them as, these were cars invented because they hadn't invented chest hair toupees yet. And in the 20 teens, when someone said, oh, come on, don't be that guy, this is the guy they're talking about. As Porsches became more accessible through the used car market and values jump all over the map like an escaped convict, the brand itself rises in the rankings of public menace. For every BMW driver hogging the fast lane and every Altima driver tailgating in the slow lane, there's a gummy chode and a used Porsche riding the shoulder, rocking the finance bro lean and a half-lit stubby cigar and a clean-shaven head, and if the sun ever hits that skin dome, you might as well be staring into the Ark of the Covenant. Except God has no place on these axles. He stays up in his fluffy, clouded kingdom, making children who will grow into adults that drive Toyotas, and pray they'll live to see the day that karma finally visits a Porsche driver. Porsche Boxster. We don't need life insurance, honey. Huck! If I croak, just sell the Boxster and don't accept trades! But here's the thing. With a Boxster, there's an unspoken expectation that car snobs will look at this and just say, it's a poor man's 911, which doesn't really hold water because as we saw, this thing costs the equivalent of $90,000. And newer ones are six figures. Look, people are going to believe what they're going to believe, whether or not it actually holds true to their personal experience. Because if they would give Porsche an honest chance, there's a good possibility that they'd be won over by the handling alone. Even if the Boxster was never designed to be the fast Porsche. But more than a lot of auto brands, how much you enjoy a Porsche really depends on where you're driving it. Southeastern Pennsylvania is probably not the best place for these cars. Because even if you avoid the winter months and all the road salt, you're still dealing with roads that are always changing. They're ripping them up. Oh my god. Fresh oil and chips? 
Yum, yum, yum. Delicious, huh? Right. Drive over that thing. <laughs> Cracks in the road, potholes, tar snakes, unfinished construction. The times where they just rip up the road and don't put anything down and you're just driving on an old washboard. Steel bridges. Steel great bridges. Byways with low clearances and high clearances with no clearances, no shoulders. Just openly hostile terrain to a car like this. But in those rare stretches of Pennsylvania land that can accommodate the Boxster, you'll see a potential of what Porsche was going for here. They weren't trying to outdo the 911 or even the 914. They were just trying to save their own bacon with a Hail Mary Roadster since Porsche was hard up for cash in the early 90s. Yes, they still came across as a prestige brand, but with the economy going down and prices staying the same, it was getting harder to justify owning one as anything other than a novelty. A 2016 report by Road & Track recalled that annual sales for Porsche had plummeted from 50,000 units to just 14,000 between 1986 and 1993, with the United States market accounting for only 3,000 of those sales. In short, Porsche came very close to declaring bankruptcy in the 90s owing to how expensive production was getting and how the U.S. economy couldn't really sustain a market for cars at this pricey and over-engineered. So they reached out to Toyota to help streamline the production process. Toyota engineers came in like Winston Wolfe in Pulp Fiction, didn't say please, and cut their entire process to the bone, so no one was working on anything that wasn't absolutely necessary to efficient, on-time delivery. It was the automotive equivalent of a father who hears a child express boredom and says, Oh, you're bored. Well, I can find you something to do. <laughs> Manufacturing errors and production time were virtually cut in half as Porsche tried to make their own Miata, but with hints of the old 550 Spider. Now, you could argue whether or not they hit the mark, but pull into a car show and anybody looking to hand out a free burn is going to congratulate you on your fine Miata. Except, is this as good as a Miata? Is this even as good as a Saturn Sky? It's an odd comparison, but they're both roadsters, aren't they? Well, a Miata is here to teach you about driving. It's to teach you about basic overseer, some basic maneuvers. But just like GM and the Corvette, there was no way Porsche was going to let the Boxster overtake the 911. So even while the two cars had similarities, and the Boxster and the Cayman that followed, they weren't allowed to be more powerful than the 911 even as it had the potential to be so. What we got was a driver's car for enthusiasts who were priced out of the upper, upper range of Porsche's catalog. Porsche Boxster, the recession roadster. The comparison with the 911 ultimately didn't matter to anybody but 911 owners who wanted to gatekeep Porsche ownership, like lifelong fans of Kate Bush getting mad because people think they only know her because of Stranger Things. Ultimately, the end goal of more Porsche owners was achieved thanks to the Boxster, which became a hit. In fact, it was their best-selling model for its first seven years of production. But successful doesn't always mean good. And if you're a hipster, it never does. Is a Porsche, is a Porsche Boxster well worth the trouble? Is it worth the maintenance? Is it worth the hard-to-access engine? A first-gen Boxster might get you noticed at a car show with other enthusiasts, especially if you manage to find one with clean headlights. Oh my God, these dippy eggs. They corrode from the inside. I have yet to see a first-gen Boxster with these headlights that aren't all clouded. Plus, you're also buying a car that's going to get gapped by a CRX with a K-swap and trash bag windows. But then, what is a Boxster really here to do? It's here to make you feel content. At the end of this drive, we were just cruising on the way back into town, and he had a, a CD of Weather Channel music that he burned himself. And we're just in fifth gear, Cruise, it was a wonderful day, 78 degrees, low humidity. Like, this is really, really, really nice. It handles, but it's cushy, it's comfortable, it's... <sighs> it was just a lovely, lovely afternoon. A Boxster is for more... a more unserious Porsche driver. If they get into arguments about Porsche, it happens to be in a Discord chat. And it's forgotten by lunchtime. A dispassionate person. The car community could probably use a lot more of them right now.